Well, hi. Uh, my name is Tom Rebecki, and I'm here in my uh, shop, the Red Barn, in Healdsburg today. And today we have a huge honor. I've got my normal partner in mischief, Bobby Vega, here on the end. And we have Jack Cassidy, the one and only Jack Cassidy, as many people consider Jack the father of the American rock bass scene. Uh, it it's more just like about... grandfather these days. Yeah. <laughs> I think we're all in that category to some extent, you know, aren't we? We're all a little long in the tooth here, but... Uh, what a huge honor it is to have you in the shop and to have you visiting today. And this is, uh, well, first of all, I hope you had a good flight up here. It was uh, comfortable and warm and safe. And Everything was just peace. dandy. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a great environment for me. Uh, it's, a, it's a bit of coming full circle, as, I, as uh, Bobby knows and, and you know that, that I've always dabbled in, uh, in this genre of uh, building instruments and and um, working with that uh, parameter. And uh, so here I am, I've commissioned Tom here and put the challenge up beforehand to build an instrument for me and for everyone that a bass player can play without uh, amplifying uh, reinforcement. Uh, a, a true bass guitar that will actually have bass-like properties in the room across from, for, for instance, a mandolin or another acoustic guitar. I work with a guy called Yorma McAlkinen who does a finger-style finger guitar in our group, Hot Tuna. And uh, it's not a loud form of playing. It's not, it's not heavy hitting or any of that uh, kind of thing. It's a very articulate. I, I often say it's like having two hands on the piano instead of one. You know, you, you, he does bass lines, he does support lines with the thumb, he does melody with the fingers. And we've developed over the, the last 50 years of playing together, 50 years plus, um, wow. uh, a rapport between uh, the function of a bass guitar, which is what I play, because I started out playing guitar and moved to bass guitar. Um, and and uh, the acoustic guitar, but I'm a closet stand-up bass player that doesn't play well. But I love the tone. A lot of my early heroes, Charlie Mingus and Ray Brown, and so many other great players from the jazz world and the classical world of of the instruments of the double bass and the cello. Those two instruments, the timbre and the tone, of have all it was what pulled me into bass guitar playing in the first place. Uh, so I always have that as part of my makeup, and, and I wanted an instrument that would have enough body and volume, uh, but be, be able to play it like a, like a bass guitar, but in a room where it would hold its own, where I could be inspired by the instrument, by the tone. Uh, and this is not an instrument to necessarily play a lot of notes on in a very rapid succession. This is an instrument I want for you to play just the opposite, to play very few notes, but have those notes carry enough weight that you don't feel like you've got to fill the time up with another note because your notes just dropped off. So that's the challenge. It's the spaces that I want to carry the tone and the note placement. and. Um, if that is, if, if Tom's able to do that, nope. you know, then, uh, then I'll have an instrument that I can pick up at home by myself in a room and, and be inspired by the tone of the instrument. That will drive me, as we like to say, that, that will take me down the rabbit hole wherever it's going to take me. So there we go, and, um, and uh, this is the, the first uh, gathering uh, to, to look at the the beginning construction of uh, this instrument that I commissioned um, uh, in the uh, middle of the, the year in 2013. Hi there. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, uh, we have tried, we we're trying with this. I uh, know you're out there, but you know, <laughs> when I'm thinking, you know, I get this far away look, you know. <laughs> you know, the, the whole uh, purpose of this blog that we're doing here, as silly as it is, is to be as non-commercial as possible. You know, we, we, one of the reasons why Bobby and I wanted to do this and uh, wanted to do this for years is because we have our own language. We carry on. Bobby's worked so close with me on basses and on guitars. And uh, over the years, the people say we, we speak our own language. And so to have you here is a huge honor for both of us. I think 
When you showed up with this challenge for me, it was really the kind of thing I love because if you're building one thing, then you have to build the same thing again and again and again. You know, I've always wanted to be on the cutting edge. So Jack's challenge to me, once again, was to build an instrument that would have that kind of response. And uh, in order to make a guitar that wasn't just a guitar, big guitar with four strings on it, making believe it was a bass, and particularly for an artist of Jack's caliber, because he's a deep, deep musician, you know, a conversation with Jack will show you his years of experience. And when he talks to me, I try to pay very close attention to every aspect of what he says. He talked to me about, he actually put my finger on the bass and actually stroked the note as he would stroke it. Very much of a teaching role for me as a guy who's interpreting a lot of different players' work. And uh, one of his points was, the halfling bass, which I built for Bobby, was very much designed for Bobby and uh, to make a dimensional quality of sound out of it. Uh, but uh, Bobby's a different kind of player and, and uh, with a much different kind of approach and yet you both have a common language. Uh, so for me, I, I attempted to, to turn this and to make it a much bigger instrument than it really physically can be. I'm working with my halfling type top and we're using a wedge-shaped design to increase the air mass in the lower section of the instrument so that it literally sits on your lap. I can get as much air mass into the instrument as possible and you can see the interior structure. I've also chosen the shape of this thing based on the success of this guitar, which I originally built, it just happens to be on this calendar, but the shape of it, it's a reverse teardrop. So seeing this as a, as, a, as a final rendered shape, I did this because when I was asked to build a teardrop, I thought I'll make a teardrop that puts the base real estate on this side of the soundboard because you need length of the soundboard, not an idiot teardrop on this side. I shouldn't say that, not a teardrop on this side because that was a real design a concept. And oddly enough, this year I have a commission to build a standard teardrop, uh, my teardrop. But this was my way of saying to the industry, this is, there's all this extra real estate here. We can take advantage of this. And since I don't have to interrupt this with a sound hole and a conventional arch top, I can put the sound port up here. And we have really huge length available for bass propagation. The other part of the, uh, uh, and the wedge, uh, which is not my original invention. This was from my great, great dear soulmate and friend, Linda Manzer, who thought of the wedge and of course, Linda and I are working on the projects together, and you know, I called her and said, can I have permission? She's ma making me do a lot of really unmentionable things, but we're good buddies, and uh, that was what we're doing. But I thought this was the ideal adaption to this, this particular type of instrument. Explain the wedge. Uh, the wedge is an instrument that is shaped so that it's narrower on the top, wedged out on the bottom, because the ergonomics of an instrument, when most of us play a guitar, if you look at most of what we do, we're holding the instrument and we're looking a little bit on the neck, the instrument is typically angled back a little bit. And I studied your videos for your incredible Epiphone bass. Jax has a bass made by Epiphone that he's designed, uh, which is a semi-hollow style of bass, beautiful instrument. But when you watch, I watched you play that instrument on your videos at uh, Bobby's suggestion, and we could see as the instrument sat here, it sat at a certain angle, your hands were, and this is the way you seem to naturally play that instrument, so I thought that adapting this to you would be a good choice. The point, the fact that it's a teardrop just gives me more wedge shape in a kind of an artistic way. And because this instrument has been followed by a lot of people, it's, it's kind of a cool thing. You have to have a little art somewhere in all of this. But what drives me most is the sound of the instrument. So Jack's challenge also is can you make an instrument that's acoustically really viable? And I wanted to combine the worlds of the uh, steel string guitar, or the rather the true jazz instrument with the, I think that's our resident frog or a phone ringing. Um, wanted to combine this. <laughs> See, I told you this is a live blog, and this is why I kind of like this. We're not, we're really not doing this in a, in a super really formal way. Do we have any frog treats? Whose phone is that? Uh, it's, a, it's yours. It's mine? Excuse me. Please <laughs> tell me. Duck. Please tell me that Duck is not your wife. You know what? It, oh, got Buddha Dink too. No. <laughs> Pardon me. I will just kill this. I apologize for that. See, uh, so. when, for those of you who have mother-in-laws, I always wanted to put Ernie K. Doe's mother-in-law for the ringtone, but you know that's another story. <laughs> uh, I like the, what's the what's the first line of the first first? The worst person I know. Thank you. Anyway, <laughs> that's just a slight aside. 
Do we have to get BMI clearance for that or ASCAP clearance or anything? No, probably not. No, I think maybe that's added to the <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's uh, the, the idea to have these two incredible maestros at the same table for me is a huge treat. So, you know, pardon me for being a little giddy today. It's a delight, delightful thing post Christmas, day after Christmas. We're enjoying the, you know, the holiday spirit here as well. So it's just really wonderful. I'm honored to have uh, two, two, uh, two guys who patrol that particular part of the underworld so well. But, uh, you know, to, to continue with this, the concept of we've just gotten the top on the instrument. And what I've done is to take what is common in the uh, stand up bass, which is the bass bar which is on the inside, you'll see there's a bridge involving a, this piece, pardon me, Jack, this is a bass bar, uh, but it's also reduxed to have passages cut through it so I can put the much diminished side of the X-Brace, which is a standard part of the Vega Rebecca bass, and I call this, you know, the first one of these things was the Vega bass, uh, so I still think of it that way. I would not have built it were it not for listening to Bobby making my ears jump, frankly. Um, and so, like a Boucher brace, this will translate most of the energy right into the, uh, the base side of the soundboard with this elongated grain structure. We leave slightly under here to give us more area underneath the tail block so that that's even viable. This allows the energy to get translated much like an electrical circuit or a wire directly down into the top. And the energy will dissipate uh, because the X brace will let that energy dissipate and translate very quickly to those other parts of the soundboard. So what I'm expecting here is a very large bass, acoustically audible bass, with a complex decay, which will create uh, what I call texture because of the slight differentiation in the soundboard's uh, articulation. It's a halfling soundboard, so the flat side of the soundboard is more bass specific. Carved up section of the top is, and if you orient it that way, you'll see that is more carved like an arch top. So this should give us the best of all worlds. This is like taking a double bass. And, but still not, and putting it into the same box as the guitar, giving you the ability to have that big textural, the thing that stuck the most in my head when you talked to me. You said, and all your references to Mingus, because uh, Mingus, is, Mingus is extraordinary. You talked about watching him very close up and listening to him. You talked about the way your string, uh, you had me brush the string the same way you do, which is so different than what, what Bobby does. All of that really sunk deeply into my consciousness. And so with this, you know, I'm trying to bring these worlds somewhat together. And I think we'll be able to do it with this instrument because it features deep air mass. It features uh, bass bar. It features, and my original plan was not to use anything but the bass bar and a little bit of an X brace. But as I built it, as with anything, you have to put your hands on it. And you have to experience it and then decide what's really going to work. So it was you know, kind of the way this has come along. Uh, I noticed something here. Yep. Just now. Um, I noticed the, the, the tail block here um, is not touching the top of the, the spruce top. So is that so this can continue resonating? Yes. But it looks like it's going to touch in the back. It touches in the back. So exactly. what I've done is to take that tail block and relieve it to give you more soundboard uh, right. to what's really appropriate. And uh, you asked me a question earlier in, uh, today, which was about the size of that tail block. And, it's for two reasons. One, to mass load the instrument, because mass loading the terminus points of an instrument helps to create less loss of electrical energy, and, uh, or what I consider to be energy in an electrical model. But it also counterweights the instrument, because the practicality of playing a, an instrument with an elongated neck is you want the instrument to balance in your hands. You know, And uh, it seemed like the ideal way to do this. Otherwise, it's a fairly conventional um, structure. What was interesting about this, however, was that in order to make this, I didn't want to just take the top and then create an angle off the top, so I split all of the angles equally, which meant that we bent that material at about nine inches thick. I made a skirt to go around the entire piece of material, and we architected it and laid it out, and I made a pencil line around it. So I took both sides of that wedge, because it's not just two planes like this, it's two planes like this. So the architecture becomes incredibly complex. So I couldn't even figure out how to make this without creating this outside sort of marking device. And then we cut it by hand. That was a day when there were a lot of chips flying and a lot of risks taken. But now that we've figured out how to do this, I now can take those lofted patterns and create the next uh, instrument from it. And um, so the top is Engelman spruce, which is a, a rounder, uh, softer sounding material in the sense of uh, 
more bass specific, less edgy, because I think the instrument will have plenty of bark. Back and sides are myrtle, uh, which is bay laurel, which your mother made soup out of. Uh, but it's a fantastic sounding material with a history of bass, you know, specificity, really great. So we're just sort of looking at how it fits in, in, into Jack's hands. To build a big instrument like this, Jack's not six foot three, for God's sake, so I have to work around his physical structure like with anybody who comes to me and try to find a way to make all of these things work together and not become awkward to play. So I hope this works out in that way. That's my... Oh. That's his disclaimer. That's my disclaimer, just in case it doesn't work. <laughs> well, Bobby, you know, when we worked together on the half leg, I mean, how many times did you come over here and sit with me and, and just say some? Sometimes you had to say the same thing ten times for me to really get it. You well, know, do you? You had all the recipes, and then when Samandis, when you did the halfling guitar, and you said, I got it, I got it. <laughs> and I went to the, wherever that was, up at the, the Hillsborough Guitar Show, the Chateau, whatever that is, the Claire. Rooster, or, yeah. uh, Chateau. Uh, and you hit the low note, and I went, And then after that, you, that's when everything really just like came together and, and whoosh, whoosh, lined up, and that was it. Well, you and I worked an awful lot on instruments together, so, you know, you use language like fire right, you know, and uh, another one of our Bobbyisms for the day is to fire right. You know, what does that really mean? Well, we would get a string on an instrument and we would, we would try to get that, that string so that when he picked up the instrument and he played it, <clears throat> there wasn't any thinking about it. It just naturally happens, and that's, Bobby calls that firing right. I adopted that vocabulary, and I expect to go through a similar process here with, you know, with you on this instrument because... You have different, different end goals, but you're still both tremendous musicians and very musical. Well...